Welcome to week two of the End Time Series, everybody. If you're here for the first time, my name is Marlon, last name is Medina, and God gave me the beautiful privilege to be the lead and founding pastor of Crave Church. So if you're here for the first time, we want to tell you that this is family, this is home. Welcome. Welcome to your space of grace. Thank you so much for joining us on week two. So today we're going to be looking at two very important characters in the end times, and that is the false prophet and the antichrist. Then we're going to be looking at what the Bible calls the mark of the beast. So we're going to start off today, like right away, uh, with the false prophet. The false prophet is one of the main characters in the end times that doesn't get much press. And uh, I don't know why. I think that the Antichrist just steals the show completely. But this false prophet is actually going to play a very big major role in the end times. He plays a huge role for the Antichrist. But it seems like there isn't much conversation about him when it comes to sermons and pastors preaching about it. So today I want to dedicate an entire portion to this one man called the false prophet. And I'm going to give you some facts about him. And the first one is that he is called in the book of Revelations, the second beast. Revelations chapter 13, verse 11 says this. Then I saw, watch this, a second beast coming out of the earth. So the Bible has a lot of symbolisms, especially in the book of Revelations. And what the Bible talks about when it comes to the Antichrist is that he's called a beast that comes out of the uh, sea, out of the out of the sea. And the reason why it's out of the oceans, the sea is because this is a representation of nations. But the Antichrist comes out of the sea. This guy, the second beast, the Bible says he's going to come out of the earth. So he is called the second beast. The Antichrist is called the first beast. The second thing that, and the second fact that I want you to see is that he will have a godly appearance. In the same verse of uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, it says this. It had horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. So a lamb is what Jesus uses to represent himself. A dragon is what we see in the Bibles and the scripture as the enemy, Satan. So this guy's going to look like a lamb, but he's going to speak like a dragon, meaning he's going to have a form of godliness. So this guy has to convince the world that he is pious and that he is religious and that he is godly. The requirements for the false prophet is that the world must trust that he, the world and the politicians or politics, they must trust that he is a man of God. Not a lot of people fit that description. There are very few people around the world that fit that description where the world recognizes him as a godly man. He's also going to have to be a man that promotes unity a lot. He's going to have a form of godliness, but it's going to be a dragon speaking through him. He has to promote godliness. He has to promote, sorry, uh, unity. He has to look godly, but he's actually going to be empowered by Satan. So he will have a form of godliness. The politics, the politicians, politics, the world of politics has to trust him. The masses and the whole world has to trust him as a man of godliness. Here's a third fact. He will promote worship to the Antichrist. Revelations 13 verse 12 says this. He exercised all the authority of the first beast. Who's the first beast? So what's it trying to say? That he exercised the authority of who? The Antichrist. And he required all the earth. Watch this. And it's people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed, which we're going to be looking at in a bit. So this guy is going to, his job will be to draw people to the Antichrist. His one job is to promote. He's like a hype man for the Antichrist. He wants to push people to place their eyes and place their faith on the Antichrist. This man, the false prophet, is going to play the role of what we would say the Holy Spirit. Because... Just like God has the trinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's an unholy trinity, which is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Remember that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to point people's hearts towards Jesus. This false prophet, his ministry, his job is to point people toward the Antichrist. Yeah, his job will be to draw people on the earth to the false worship of the Antichrist. Number four, he will perform miracles. Revelations 13, verses 13 to 14. This is what it says. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. So if you see a guy calling on fire and it doesn't happen, you laugh at him. Right? 
So imagine I stood up like at Bunsen Lake, right? We're doing baptism. And then I want to pull off an Elijah and I go, fire from heaven, fall now. And nothing happens. You laugh at me. But if I were to stand at Bunsen Lake during a baptism and I'd be like, Father, let fire fall now. And then it fell. You would be freaked out. That's the same thing this guy's going to do. He's going to win the masses through miracles. And it says that everyone was watching. Look at verse 14. It says, and with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belong to this world. So I wrote down my notes here. Be careful that your faith is never directed by miracles, signs, wonders, Be careful not to place your faith or let your faith be directed by miracle signs, wonders, or experiences. A lot of people, listen to this, a lot of people are quickly swept off their feet by what they see because they live by sight and not by faith. And this is why so many people are deceived in our era. It's because wherever they see a miracle, they want to follow. Wherever they feel something here, they want to follow. Wherever they see wonders, they want to follow. But God calls us to live by faith, not by sight. The false prophet will deceive the world through miraculous wonders. That's crazy. That's why every single one of us, we cannot, because God gives the devil power. He grants it to him. And that's why sometimes there are miracles that happen. Like, for example, uh, a lot of people in a lot of different religions, they will have their idols and their idols will possibly throw a tear or two. And then the people are like, oh my God, you see our, our God or our, our statue is real. It's God. Did you see the tear coming out of that statue? And they will worship that statue as God because it was something supernatural. Other times they will see things possibly like a statue blink or something like a whatever, you know, a lot in a lot of religions, there's like a statue, they'll worship it and they'll put cameras on it and then the thing will blink and people are like, oh my God, it is God. Oh, we worship it. Or other times things will appear in the skies or things will happen uh, supernaturally and then people will start devoting their worship to those supernatural things. What we have to understand is that the devil also has supernatural power. And that's why we have to live our faith not by what we see, but by what God's word says and our faith in Christ. This, This false prophet will deceive people through miraculous signs and wonders. Number five, he will set a statue for the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14 to 15 says this. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast. Who's the first beast? Who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. So this statue is actually going to be able to speak. That's going to be freaky. Then the statue, watch this. Then that statue that spoke, the statue of the beast commanded that everyone refusing Anyone refusing to worship it must die. So here's this this guy, the false prophet. He's going to get people to build a statue for the Antichrist. Then he's going to give that statue the power to speak. Then the statue is going to speak and is going to command the world, worship me. And if you don't worship me, I'll kill you. This is exactly what uh, Daniel's three friends were going through in Babylon. Remember that they called all the people of Babylon to worship the statue of the king? Yeah. And only three dudes out of like, I don't know how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of people did not bow down. And guess what that king did? He threw them into the fire. That's where we get the song. There'll be another in the fire, right? Or trust in God. He's been the fourth man in the fire time after time. Yeah, we got that from that story. And that story repeats itself in Revelation. Through the Antichrist, but this time it's going to be Satan himself because you got to understand that the one desire of Satan is to be worshiped. That's his one sole desire. Number six, he will initiate the mark of the beast. The false prophet will initiate the mark of the beast. Revelations 13 to 16 to 18 says this He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So it's crazy to see how we're actually beginning to see the birth pains of this mark. 
the birth pains, meaning the mark has not been birthed yet. But right now in our society, in our era, we're starting to see the, the birth pains of this mark in our current day. Yeah. And so I want you to see a few videos on what I deem as precursors to the mark of the beast. And uh, these videos are very intense for me to see. Uh, the first set of videos has to do with chimp implants on how people are purchasing things through chip implant. And so here are the videos. One, two, three, go. Can you imagine yourself paying for things with a wave of your hand? European company WalletMore is selling what it says is the world's first entirely safe implant in your hand that can be used for contactless payments. The implant retails for about $215 US. About the size of a grain of rice, it uses Near Field Communication or NFC to transmit payment information. That's the same technology that allows you to make contactless payments using a smartphone. According to WalletMore, the tiny microchip and antenna are encased in naturally sourced material and do not require any kind of battery. But even if the implant is medically safe, it raises important questions about privacy, security, and trackability. This is just the beginning of where so-called biohacking will go in the near future. Are you ready for microchip implants to augment yourself? My name is Chip Girl. Yes, you heard me right. Chip Girl. It is a type of technology that can do many things. One of them being opening a door. It also opens our bedroom door, as well as our office, as well as the drawers in our office. Our closet is chipped. And this is really cool. We can chip all of the doors. Look, look at it. We can even lock up our towels. See? We also chipped the gym. And the elevator. What the tech? Oh, whoops, it was already unlocked. Ta-da! We've also chippied the hallway and the cinema room. We also entertain a lot. So having a door and a door over there helps because we're able to lock it if we have parties and we don't want people to go on specific sides of the house. All it really is is a form of technology that we can program to do cool things around our house. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And in this second video, like the second video that we showed, isn't it crazy to see the amount of control these chips can give or take? These chips, if the government or whoever's in control of them later on in the future does, it pleases them to shut you down, they can shut you down in an instant from your house, your car, your bank account, from everything. So that's insane. Now, the first couple of videos that I showed you have to do with the chip. The second couple of videos that I'm gonna be showing you have to do with the palm, and I want you to pay attention. There's a difference between the chip and, and, and pay by palm. Here are the next two videos. I'm a piano, piano, it's a big vibe, but the girls them know, steadily, steadily, steadily. I'm a piano, piano. Move over Apple Pay. Amazon is trying to muscle its way into your digital wallet. Amazon is ramping up its contactless payment system nationwide that works by scanning the palm of your hand right there. Kit Doe takes it for a test drive. So the new payment systems have been rolling out across the country for the past year. Finally, here in the Bay Area, we get our very first one, and it launched this morning. You really got to hand it to Amazon. Will you be paying with your palm today? For trying to put the future of payments right in the palm of your, you know. Right there, perfect. It's called Amazon One, a new contactless payment system that launched for the first time in Northern California at their store in Santana Row. To sign up, first insert a credit card and then hold your hand over the special camera. It'll scan the lines, ridges, and even pattern of veins inside your hand. The algorithm then creates a unique palm signature. The whole process takes about a minute. And you can just hold your hand right over it. Tommy, alas, was the first person in the Bay Area to sign up. Uh, what'd you think? Uh, I think it was really cool, very convenient uh, form of payment, just quick and easy. Liz Gonzalez thinks the new technology could come in handy. That was easy. There you go. People like me, I'm very forgetful. <laughs> I always forget my credit card or my watch, and now I don't need to remember to bring my palm. <laughs> if anyone can get this popular, it'll be Amazon. Ian Schur with CNET says all signs point to this new technology as being safe and reliable. In the past year, the company has rolled out the palm scanners to 60 locations around the country, including mobile ticketing for a concert venue in Denver and a number of Whole Foods locations. But for consumers, old habits die hard. The reality is that a lot of introducing new technology is convincing people to use it. And how much easier is it to use than just pulling out my credit card and paying that way? 
but we Americans are very hesitant to jump on this stuff. And so I am curious to see whether or not it's really going to end up going anywhere with us or whether we're going to wait until some other technology comes along. Is it that messed up? What's crazy to me is that in the first one, it takes chips. In the second one, it's patterns and scans of your veins and the lines on your palm. That's insane to me. So that leads us to the next point, and that is the mark of the beast. Here's the meaning. That's my first point, the meaning of 666. Number seven is the number of God. Six is a number of man, which represents creation. Man is creation. God is creator. Number six represents creation and limitation. Number seven represents completion, and it represents God. He's authority. Seven is greater than six. Meaning that 666 is telling you that Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet will never be greater than God. Six, six, six is the unholy trinity telling you that Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet can never be greater than God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So it's just letting you know that this is the number of man, and it actually says it right there in um, Revelation chapter 13. Here's the second thing that you need to know about the mark. The mark will be literal and visible. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 says this. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, watch this, to be given a mark on. The word on is translated in the Greek as epi, E-P-I, and it's always translated all over the scriptures as on. The reason why this is important to note is because there's a difference between the mark being on the skin and in the skin. This helps us know that the mark will not be hidden. So it will not, and I don't think that it can, I don't think that it will be a chip planted in the skin or an invisible thing in the dermis. It will be literal and it will be visible. There are many hypotheses. There are many uh, um, uh, guesses as to what this mark is. And like I said, it's not the vaccine. Just letting y'all know, it's not the vaccine. (laughs) But one of the guesses for the mark is that it will change and alter people's DNA. I'm not so sure just because of this discovery that I've made just recently while researching is that the mark will be given. It'll be a mark that will be on and it will not be in. So it will be visible. And if you look and pay attention to history and you look at people like Hitler, they always like to label things. So they would wear, what, 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 what would the soldiers of Hitler wear on their, on their arm? Yeah, and what would they tell the Jews? They would have to mark the Jews as well. So this, this is a thing that has to do with marking and I guess it has to do with allegiance. And that's what my next point is. The mark is a sign of devotion. It will be a sign of devotion to the Antichrist and the passport to engage in commerce, meaning permission to buy and sell. I believe this is why Jesus said, woe for mothers that are nursing. I believe it's because many parents will see their children suffer hunger, and the only way to feed their children would be through sealing their fate in the lake of fire for eternity. That is a tough choice. It's either I see my child die, or I seal my fate in the lake of fire for eternity. That's a very tough place to be in. That's a very tough place to be in. Some people actually think I'll live my life the way that I want to right now. And I just won't get the mark when I get left behind in the tribulation. Stupid. And I wrote down my notes. My goodness, how sad to see that level of ignorance. Because if someone can't live for Christ in this era, simply because there's too much temptation to resist, I want to tell you what's coming won't be temptation. It will be tribulation. Yes. So I believe that there's going to be, this is why Jesus said, when he's talking about the end times, woe to mothers that are nursing. Because in those times, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough. And, and listen, when Jesus says, woe, he's not saying that lightly. He's not saying the way that some of us read it. We're like, well, to those who are nursing, nah, 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 nah. and then you just keep on reading like nothing's happening. No, no, no. Stop and pause and actually digest what he just said. Yeah. Remember that Jesus has a greater capacity to feel yeah. 
He has a greater capacity to love, but he also has a greater capacity to hurt. And when he speaks words like, whoa, he's the creator of this. He knows this. He already saw this. He's trying to tell you that it's not going to be easy. Now, buying and selling won't be the main reason for the mark, in my opinion. Devotion and worship will be the primary reason for the mark. Look what Revelation 13 verse 12 says. It says, he exercised all authority of the first beast. Who's the he here? Good job, you nailed it. And he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. So listen to this. This mark is a permanent and visible sign that you have pledged your soul and your total allegiance to Satan. That's what it means. Number five, the marks reveal. The mark of the beast will not be revealed until halfway through the tribulation. This means that none of us who are in Christ will ever be able to take it or see it. We will be raptured before this thing comes to play. So if you're ever like, oh my God, what if I have to take it? You won't have to. Now, the only way that you'll take it is if you're left behind. So please don't get left behind. (laughs) Now, the timing of the rapture is one of the most heavily debated topics in eschatology. Eschatology is the study of end times. But when you pay attention to the original, we do see the saints are different to the church because the word for church in the original is called ecclesia. And the word ecclesia is nowhere found during the judgment of the tribulation found in Revelation 16 to 18. So in Revelations, it does speak about saints being conquered, which we're going to see that. But saints is different than the church. Ecclesia is the word for church. The ecclesia started in Acts chapter 2, where the baptism of the Holy Spirit came in. Then we're going to come, and then the rapture is what concludes the the stage or the the, the phase of the church. The rapture is what concludes it. We never see the church in any of the judgments. In the book of Revelation, you will never see the word Ecclesia in there. So that goes to tell us that we will not be a part of it. I think it would be very weird for God to be like, you are my bride and I love you and I cannot wait to marry you. But before I marry you, I'm going to pound you with my wrath. And after I'm done pouring out my wrath on you, (laughs) then I'll receive you onto me. It doesn't make sense. So a lot of people believe in this, in which we're going to be looking at possibly in the next couple of weeks, the different positions of the rapture. Uh, but we have a uh, pre-trib view that we will not be here, meaning the mark is something that we will not see or be able to take. It is my opinion, along with other great Bible teachers and theologians, that we will not be on earth during this period. And the church said, praise God. <laughs> Number five, all who take the mark are eternally damned. Once you take the mark, there's no forgiveness. There's no second chance for you. And you have absolutely no salvation. The mark is your personal, visible, public, and permanent allegiance that you rejected Jesus Christ and you received the Antichrist. That's what the mark is. Look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 11. Anyone who worships the beast and his statue, or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand, must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night. For they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. And that leads us to our last and final character to look at today, the Antichrist. All right, let's take a look at the first fact. Number one, the Antichrist's reveal. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until after the rapture of the church. So there's no point in guessing who he is. It's not Obama. (laughs) It's not Trump. And it's not Biden. I don't think Biden can qualify anyway. We need to pray for Biden. 
I meant that with all sincerity. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses six to eight says this, and you know what is holding him back? Who's the him? Who's the what? Yeah, it says this, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. So I want to say this to you and I want to remind you all and I want to give you a little bit of hope and assurance and confidence in our God. God alone is in charge of the timing of Bible prophecy. The world, no politician, no dictator, no institution, no president can speed or slow down the progress of the end times. Why? Because God is the one who's in charge and God is the one who decides when things happen or not. God is the one who decides when the Antichrist will appear on the stage. Have you seen like a play, like a play, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And every character has a line and a time to come on stage. You can't have a character come up on stage and repeat his lines when it's not his turn. The Antichrist is a character that God decides when he comes on stage. No one can slow the progress down. No one can speed it up. So if we're, some people, are, you know, we used to believe like if so-and-so gets to be the president, oh my God, that's going to give us a window of grace and it's going to slow things down. If so-and-so becomes president, oh no, that's going to speed up the end times. A man cannot control that. God controls it. Verse seven of 2 Thessalonians chapter two, it says this, for this lawlessness is already at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one who, who's the who? Holy Spirit. Who's the what? The church. So when the church is here working through the power of the Holy Spirit, it holds him back. But when the church is raptured and the Holy Spirit is no longer working through the church, then the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Verse eight, then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. So here's the number one thing. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until the rapture. Number two, the Antichrist versus Antichrists. First John chapter two, verse 18 says this. This is John writing to the church. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist, capital A, right there, the Bible actually puts it as capital A, is coming. And already many such Antichrists, lowercase a, have appeared. From this, we know that the last hour has come. Now there's a difference, because one has a capital A, while the other one has a lowercase. The reason that I believe this is, is because only God knows the schedule for the end times. No one else knows anything in regards to the schedule of the end times. This is when Jesus says, no man, not even the angels, know when the return is only God, not even the son Christ. So if no man knows it and no angel knows, for sure the devil doesn't know it, neither do his demons. So as we wait for the rapture, so is the devil. The devil's also waiting too. Since the devil doesn't know when the timing of the prophetic timeline is, he needs to have a groomed vessel ready to use in all generations. So that's why so many people are like, Hitler was the Antichrist. Could have been, but he wasn't. He's a lowercase Antichrist, right? Uh, Stalin could have been. All these other people that we've seen in history that could have been, possibly could have been people that the enemy had as a vessel groomed to use. Because the devil doesn't know when Christ is going to return and pick up the church. So he needs to have someone ready in every generation. So as we speak here today, and as I stand here before you this Sunday on this screen, here's the truth. The Antichrist is probably amongst us already here on this earth today. Ready to go. The enemy is just waiting for the church to be raptured because the church, through the work of the Holy Spirit, is holding it back. But once we're raptured, We're now out of the way. When we're out of the way, he can possess that man, that vessel, and rise up in the global scheme and platform of government. Number three, the Antichrist will be assassinated, then he will resurrect. We see this in Revelation chapter three, verses three to four. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. Who's the beast? They worship the dragon. Who's the dragon? For giving the beast such power 
and they also worshipped the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, and they worshipped the Antichrist. Yeah. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? So they were worshipping. This is the world, y'all. Yeah. Worshipping the Antichrist and Satan. And you can see a rise in Satan worship now. Yeah. You know, in schools, they have, uh, you know how they have a whole bunch of school clubs after school? Like we, we even started a, a, a Christian club back when we started a church. We had some, we had Christian clubs in like three high schools. Now after schools, you can have satanic clubs. Uh, look at the, look at the concert that, what's this guy? Uh, uh, Sam Smith. Those are, that's, that's Satan worship. That's satanic. So many songs now that even secular people are starting to get like a little bit like uneasy about. Because their favorite artists and celebrities are just very blatantly worshiping Satan. Yeah. So this, that the whole, like the masses will be worshiping Satan and the Antichrist, it doesn't seem far-fetched anymore. But the Bible says that he will have a wound that looks like beyond recovery, but then he will rise up and he will be healed. This will be one of his counterfeit signs and miracles to deceive the masses because Satan is created. He's a created being. And as a matter of fact, he is a demoted angel. So he cannot have the power to resurrect back to life. Look at the apostle Paul put it in second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. He said this, this man will come to do the work of Satan. Who's this man? Antichrist. He will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. So he's counterfeit. He's not God. So he will appear to have a lot of power, but he is not God. And he doesn't have the power to resurrect. But I think this is going to be one of his counterfeit signs and miracles that will deceive the many. And they will be like, oh my God, he is God. Got it? Number four, the Antichrist will be homosexual, androgynous, or asexual. Yes. Daniel chapter 11, verse 37. It says this, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. So he's either homosexual, meaning that he is just going to pay attention to men. He's either androgynous, meaning you don't know what he is. He's, he looks guy, he looks girl, he looks girl, he looks guy. Or he will be asexual, meaning that he will not have a desire. He will not have a sexual desire in him and no women will be able to make him fall. Because a lot of men that have been great in power, the reasons why they fell is because of women. Or vice versa, through lust and sex. You look at Samson, you look at Solomon, great man of great stature. So this guy, he's gonna be uh, lust proof. If he is asexual. So prior to our current society, prior to our current era society, in all of human history, there was never a problem defining our species as male and female. Now, there's a problem. You can't define a woman easily nowadays. It's very difficult. It's so crazy and so intense with this, this era that certain states in the US have up to 32 genders. So seeing this pattern and seeing this trend in our world, it's not far-fetched for the scriptures, this scripture, to be possible. Number five, the Antichrist will call himself God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 says this, He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. And this is where he will begin to enforce his one world religion. Remember that the Antichrist wants to establish a one world order. Yeah. One leader, one currency, yeah. one religion. Yeah. When he sits in that temple, this is where he's going to enforce the one religion. And that one religion is, I am your God, so bow to me. And if you don't bow, I'll kill you. And he will. Revelation chapter 13, verses 4 to 6 says this. They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaim. Who is able to fight against them? Verse 5. Then the beast was allowed to speak, watch this, great blasphemies against God. First of all, he was given permission. But second of all, it's messed up. He spoke a lot of blasphemies against God. And he was given authority to do whatever he wanted to for 42 months. Do the math and you'll see how long that takes. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. He is going to be blatantly against God. Speak blasphemies. Number six, the Antichrist will persecute believers and win. Revelation chapter 13 verse 7 says this. Also, it was allowed to make war. By it, it means the Antichrist, the beast. 
it was allowed to make war on the saints, not the ecclesia, and to conquer them. And authority was given it, the beast, over every tribe and people and language and nation. So once again, the saints is not the church. It's believers who were left behind or people who convert during the tribulation period. Because God in his mercy will allow preachers to preach during the tribulation. And did you know that there are two preachers that are going to be preaching during the tribulation? They're going to be supernatural preachers. A lot of them believe to be, they're called the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah will come down from heaven and they will preach and they're going to convert people to Christ. And the world is going to hate them though. And then they're going to be able to speak fire and actually kill people out of their mouth. But then the Antichrist will kill them and they will be left for dead for a couple of days there. And then they'll resurrect and ascend back to heaven. We might look at that later on. I'm not sure if we're going to look at, at this in the series, but it's interesting to see that the real Moses and real Elijah, I, I sometimes wonder, are they going to come in modern clothes or like in their old school clothes? <laughs> like, that's, that's pretty interesting, right? To think about like Moses and like, can you imagine him with like, you know, my haircut or something like that? Another thing that God's going to do is he's going to send an angel to preach the gospel around the world, an actual angel. So that means that there will be saints that will get converted, but they will be overcome. And they will be killed in a very gruesome and horrid way. Look what Revelation says. It actually tells us how. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony about Jesus and proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They all came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So this is super crazy that God is going to be so merciful that he's going to allow people to preach the gospel to souls during this time. But preaching the gospel means that you'll get beheaded and receiving the gospel also means that you'll be beheaded. One of the coolest things that we see is that God is going to send two witnesses from heaven. A lot of people believe that it's going to be Moses and Elijah. So can you imagine Moses and Elijah coming down to earth and preaching? The Bible says they're going to preach and they're going to preach the gospel. The world's going to hate on them. And I think that, he, that God's going to give them power to kill people supernaturally, I think. I, I forget how that goes. I have to read it again. But the people are going to kill them. And so the, the, it is believed that these two witnesses, the Bible doesn't give their names, but a lot of scholars and theologians believe that it's going to be Moses and Elijah. They're going to be killed and they're going to be left for dead for a couple of days in the, in the city square, wherever it is that they're going to be preaching. And then they're going to resurrect and ascend back to heaven. The Bible also says that God's going to send an angel to proclaim the gospel over the world. That is the grace of God. But it's going to be a very pricey price to pay. And it's going to be costly because it will mean that you will have to get decapitated. And don't you for a minute think that they're just going to ask you the mark or decapitation. You're going to be like decapitation, slap, and then it's over. Uh uh. They're going to torment people because what the Antichrist will want is for people to take the mark so that they can seal the faith in hell. Number seven, the Antichrist will lead people to hell. Revelation chapter 13, verse eight. And all the people who belong to this world worshiped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. When someone takes the mark, their name is out of the book of life. Yeah. And it is over. Yeah. Now, I want you to watch this report on this new show coming out on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. And this new show called Pauline is a very, very intense show that almost depicts this character called the Antichrist. So pay attention. Here it is. Well, how about them watching a new show about an 18-year-old impregnated by Satan? That's Disney's latest project. They've agreed to stream the six-part German-produced series on Disney+. Plus. The show's name is Pauline. It's produced by the same people who created the Netflix show How to Sell Drugs Online Fast. The producers say Pauline is, quote, close to their hearts. They're thrilled that Disney loves the coming-of-age story as much as we do. Don't get me wrong, I'm not encouraging a boycott of Disney. That's for you to decide as parents. But you should let Disney know how you feel. Movie Guide chairman and founder Ted Bear is calling on parents to petition Disney Plus to stop the release of Pauline on their platform. Bear wants to keep, quote, twisted and disturbing content from corrupting our children's values and beliefs. That's messed up. That's messed up, yeah. 
It's intense. To me, this shows, this show is practically, this show is practically giving you the birth story of what the Bible calls the Antichrist. Now tell me if this show doesn't tell you that unbelievers believe in what the Bible says more than Christians probably do. I believe the secular world is believing more what the Bible has to say than what Christians in the church believe. It's a little sad to me that we need to bring so many secular sources to the table in order to validate what the Bible speaks about it instead of it being the other way around. I wonder how much less impacting the series would be if I didn't bring sources from the secular world. And it's sad to me that what makes this series so crazy is that the secular confirms the biblical. Even for me and you. Isn't it crazy? The children of God who believe in a God who was the word have to look outside the word to see and believe that the word is true? Do we actually need to have secular input in order to believe what God dictated long ago is true? We're called to live by faith. That statement is for the Christians. Now for you who are skeptics and unbelievers, I pray that what we see in this series in the next couple of weeks from God's word and what we're seeing unfold before our eyes can become the evidence to you that God's word is real. Yes. Here's my conclusion. What's coming is horrible and horrendous. Yes. I pray that everyone hearing this series may take the right decisions and escape. Yes. I also pray for urgency in our hearts, for our families and those around us to receive Christ so that they don't ever have to go through what's coming. Yes. Because... It is coming. Yes. It's noticeable and it's evident that what the scriptures say is coming true. I'm going to say that one more time. It's noticeable and it's evident that what the scriptures say is coming true. Yes. And not just coming true, but it's coming true in our lifetime. Yes. This is no longer something that we predict as in the future, we're seeing it unfold before our eyes. I pray that every single one of us through this series may repent and find Jesus. So if you're here for the first time today and you've been far from God or you've walked away from God or you've never received God in your heart, Jesus Christ, today I want to lead you through a prayer right now where you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Whichever boat you're in, you're far, you walked away, or you've never come to Jesus. Today, you can come back to Jesus, or you can come to Jesus, period. Yes. The only way to escape is through Jesus Christ, placing your faith and your trust in him. Don't ever fall for the deception that the enemy, the devil, wants you to believe, which is, if I'm a good person, then I'll escape this. You will not. Yes. Because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Yes. And that forgiveness is found in Christ. So if you're watching this today, and you can feel the Holy Spirit saying, I want to save you. If you can feel God just tugging at your heart and saying, I want to save you. I pray. Open the door of your heart today because he's knocking. And we're going to make a prayer. And Romans chapter 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you will be saved. So it's a two-part thing. You gotta verbally say it, not think it in your mind or whisper it, verbally say it. But you also gotta believe what you're saying. Because some people read or some people repeat this prayer as a magical formula, thinking that that's gonna work and it's not. God has to see that you believe it in your heart. So what does that look like? It looks like this. Jesus tells you today, I died on a cross for all your sins. I died on a cross for all your mistakes. And if you believe that, if you believe that fact, that I replaced your imperfections, and that I can save you if you believe it in your heart, that I resurrected on the third day and paid the penalty for your sins, then you will be saved. So that's all that God wants. God wants you to put all your eggs on the Jesus basket. Being that after I die, I know that I'm saved because I placed my trust in Jesus. 
So how many of you today need to do that? And Jesus is calling you to place your trust in him. If that's you, I want you to repeat this prayer after me and the rest of us, we're all going to pray. We're going to pray it out loud to help those not feel uncomfortable so that they can be comfortable to pray it out loud. You ready? Close your eyes with me. Father in heaven, thank you for this word. Thank you for making a way for me to get to heaven. I pray in Jesus' name and I confess that I am a sinner, that I'm far from you. And I want to draw close. Jesus, forgive all my sins, past, present, and future sins. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I welcome you into my life. I trust that your sacrifice cleaned all my record of sins, mistakes, and wrongs. Your sacrifice is more than enough for me. So I declare, I am saved in the name of Jesus Christ. In that name we pray. And we say, Amen. Amen. If you made that decision today, welcome to the family. Heaven just threw a party for you right now. Hey, thank you so much for tuning into our YouTube channel. If today's word blessed you, I want you to do three things for me. Number one, I want you to send this to someone that you know that it will bless. Number two, subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on the bell notification. And number three, if you want to partner with us financially, there's a link down below where you can do so. And I'll see you for the next one. God bless you. Mwah.